All right, well, thank you for joining me this morning. I'm really happy to be here. I'm gonna be sharing with you uh, some of the work that I do over in Southeast Asia and give you a look into how a One Health approach is important for the conservation of wildlife and wild places. And also how the pressures that we're placing on wildlife are the very things leading to viral spillover events. So uh, I'll just tell you a little bit about me to start. Um, I am based in Laos and I work for the Wildlife Conservation Society. I'm a veterinarian and a technical advisor here. And Laos is um, a kind of medium-sized landlocked country. Uh, not everybody knows where it is. So I just thought I'd put a map up here to orient you. Um, so we're in Southeast Asia and I've been working here uh, leading the wildlife health team since 2019. So I'm going to be talking a lot about the zoonotic disease side of One Health, uh, but I'll touch on some of the other environmental links as well. Um, so there's various pathways and mechanisms that lead to increased human exposure uh, to zoonotic pathogens. And we know more about some of these pathways than we do others. Uh, some we're just starting to understand. And this is not a, a comprehensive list here. Uh, other things like climate change are impacting disease dynamics, but I won't go too much into climate change today. Uh, so let's just start with a quick overview to get everyone on the same page. I know that not everyone here is necessarily from a, a veterinary background or even a, a biology background. So I'm just gonna start with some broad concepts. Uh, so what do we know? Uh, so zoonoses or zoonotic diseases are diseases that move from animals to humans. And emerging infectious diseases or EIDs as we'll sometimes call them are dominated by zoonoses. Um, so most new pathogens that are popping up for the first time or uh, for the first time in certain locations are mostly coming from animals. And more than half of all EIDs are originating in wildlife. And you've definitely heard of some of these before, Ebola, SARS, uh, HIV, H1N1. And the frequency at which these events are happening is increasing. And in 2018, the World Health Organization added to its party disease watch list, something called Disease X. And it was defined as a serious international uh, pandemic caused by a pathogen currently unknown uh, to cause human disease. And here we are. So there are less than uh, 300 viruses from high risk viral families that are known to infect people. And there are an estimated uh, to be 1.7 million unknown viruses that are not yet discovered circulating in, in mammals and birds. And of these 700,000, um, or of these 1.7 million, sorry, there's about 700,000 which are likely to have potential to infect humans. And so of these 700,000 high risk viruses, we only understand maybe less than 0.1% of them. So for example, uh, for every known coronavirus uh, out there, there are probably thousands of unknown coronaviruses circulating in wildlife. And like I said, uh, these outbreaks of zoonotic disease um, originating in wildlife are becoming more frequent. Uh, there have been four of these major events since 2018. And emerging zoonoses have significant implications, of course, uh, for public health, but also for economic stability. So the costs of uh, many of these individual uh, recent events like SARS and Ebola uh, were estimated to be around in the tens of billions of US dollars in damages. Um, when all is tallied, uh, they're estimating that the economic devastation from COVID-19 will be orders of magnitude greater than that, probably in the tens of trillions of US dollars. So I just want to show you this graphic uh, quickly, it was out of an article that was published last year. Uh, some of these figures may be a bit outdated, um, but it gives you an idea of how much it costs to uh, deal with a pandemic after it's already underway versus how much it would cost to prevent one from happening in the first place. And so at the time, they're estimating um, damages for COVID-19 to be 11.5 trillion US dollars. 
And for scale up here, this little red um, box at the top is what it would cost to prevent these events uh, on an annual basis from happening. And that's around $26.6 billion, so quite a lot less. And when you blow this little red square up, you'll see that um, there are different components that make it up. And a lot of these pieces involve wildlife and, um, and forests. And a lot of these uh, little aspects are the areas that I'm doing my work. So early disease detection, um, reducing disease spillover from wildlife, monitoring wildlife trade, uh, reducing deforestation. They also have ending the wild meat trade in China, but um, it's important to know that wild meat trade is quite rampant across this whole region. It's, it's really not just in China. Um, it's in several of the countries uh, over here. So I am going to show you uh, a little bit about wildlife trade in Laos. Uh, some of the images are pretty graphic, so if you're not comfortable with um, seeing those sorts of things, then I'd suggest maybe you divert your uh, eyes for the next couple of slides. So we do spend a lot of time here. Um, there are quite a few wildlife markets in Laos. Some markets have more live animals, some have more um, dead animals. Some markets are bigger than others. You can see uh, in the photo on the right, there are these buckets of um, de-feathered songbirds for sale. Um, there's some more over here kind of strung up um, that you can buy in bunches. And then you have some grains and some hot sauce down here. And then the photo at the bottom I took, uh, we were just driving out to a field location. This is not at a market, it's just a roadside um, table. And we have a, a leopard cat here and what I think is maybe a, a giant flying squirrel, some other rodents and some birds. And so this is a common scene here. And so there are over a hundred markets that we know of in Laos um, and these can be easily visited. You can pull up to these markets and shop. Uh, they're not hidden. Um, some of the higher value items will be kept under the tables or in the back and you need to know who to ask for them um, and how to ask for these. And my team here in Laos has been um, working in these markets for the last decade. And they, uh, in recent years, visited 93 of these markets, which are represented with the little red dots on the map there. And they were interviewing vendors, uh, more or less undercover, about where wildlife was coming from, um, you know, where it was poached originally before it was brought to the market, how much things cost. Uh, and we've sampled different types of animals in these markets um, as part of surveillance for what we call uh, especially dangerous pathogens. And so you can imagine that there's a lot of movement of animals uh, within the country. So you can you know, trap uh, certain animals down in the south and, and maybe transport them up to a market in the north to be sold. And wildlife has also moved across borders here a lot. And this map gives you a look at some of the major routes that people take when they're trafficking wildlife. Laos is often used as like a stepping stone or a transit country um, to, to move wildlife because it's relatively easy to get wildlife in and out of here. Um, there is uh, weak law enforcement at the borders generally and um, uh, a fair amount of corruption as well. And so, you know, people in Thailand will traffic animals into Laos and then those animals will ultimately end up in China or you'll have animals even from Africa coming into Laos with their final destination being Vietnam um, and they'll move them over the land borders. And so this shows you that, you know, animals and the pathogens they carry are really not restricted uh, inside country borders. There is a lot of movement. So back to the markets, uh, you'll have wildlife and domestic animals uh, being sold, one right next to the other. Um, wildlife is generally pretty overcrowded and you'll have wild animals all on top of one another that normally wouldn't be coming into close contact with each other in the wild. 
And then you have veggies and fruit. Uh, you can see here in these images that are all displayed together. And, and all of this is handled by vendors, uh, typically with um, little to no hand hygiene. And you can shop around and, and touch the wildlife with your bare hands as you would um, when you're you know, deciding what apples to buy at the grocery store um, when, when people used to do that. Um, and the animals that are still alive are, are quite stressed. And in many cases, this will increase pathogen shedding, we know, and can make them more susceptible to infection if their immune system is compromised from the stress. And this creates an environment that some of my colleagues have uh, started to call a cauldron of contagion, which is a little bit cheesy, but um, it is true. So I hesitated to show these screenshots. It's a little bit of casual conversation between colleagues and I, um, but like I said, for the last uh, decade, the team here has been doing surveillance in, in high risk interfaces like markets to better understand what viruses are here. And we always kind of knew that disease X would show up at any time, um, probably with catastrophic consequences, but I really didn't think it was going to happen six months into my new job. Um, these are screenshots from the moment that my two colleagues that hold my position in Cambodia and in Vietnam got wind of these strange um, pneumonia reports uh, coming from China. At the time, there were only a handful of cases and it was only in um, more regional news. So it hadn't hit mainstream media yet. Uh, this was maybe the first few days of January. Um, so yeah, a, a small number of cases detected at the time. And as things gained momentum and a picture emerged of a possible viral spillover event originating in a market, we really tried to seize the opportunity to encourage change in the countries where we work. Uh, so this is an op-ed that myself and, and my colleagues wrote here and put in the newspaper in Laos back in May, uh, calling on the Lao government to shut down commercial wildlife markets. And unfortunately, um, things are still running here uh, kind of business as usual so nothing much has changed in terms of the commercial markets here. Um, China and Vietnam our neighbors have both made some pretty positive steps in the right direction uh, but we still have quite a lot of work to do here in Laos. And my colleagues in Vietnam started to uh, look back into their freezers and in their databases and this yielded some startling results uh, that highlighted the risk of wildlife trade. So samples from rodents were taken along what we call the wildlife trade chain and they tested them for coronaviruses. And what they found was that as rodents move along the trade chain from the time that they're poached in the forest, the time that they end up on a dinner plate, so sort of from forest to fork, uh, the detection rate of coronaviruses significantly increases. So this implies that the risk of someone at the end of um, this trade chain, you know, either in a market or in a restaurant, is far greater uh, than your subsistence hunter um, catching a rodent in the forest and, and bringing it immediately to his village. Uh, the risk of contracting coronaviruses uh, for people at the consumption end is far greater than it is for um, from the point of origin. So we see a lot of amplification of coronavirus along that wildlife supply chain. So finally, uh, I just want to emphasize that ending the commercial trade is an important health intervention for food insecure communities. Um, and this, this point often does get confused. So these markets that I'm talking about are high volume commercial markets that are not catering to uh, the poor. They are catering to middle to high income class people. So this wildlife is uh, brought to markets typically in, in cities or towns and they're sold at a premium. So if you buy wildlife, it's gonna be more expensive than your you know, typical chicken being sold next to it. So it's very much um, that wildlife is a, a luxury item. So what's happening now is that subsistence hunters and in indigenous communities that do rely on wildlife um, as a protein source, um, as a source of food, are going into forests 
to hunt and they're finding their forests depleted of wildlife and emptied of wildlife due to this commercial demand. Uh, and our, our colleagues in Africa are um, pretty vocal in recognizing that business as usual can't continue, um, that you know, they wanna change their eating habits and start to scale down trade in bushmeat as much as they can. But to do that, uh, we, we need to support those food insecure um, communities. And uh, at the same time as reducing wildlife consumption, uh, support them by scaling up things like domestic animal source foods and alternative protein sources. But it's not easy uh, to close commercial trade. It requires interventions at different levels. You have different actors, um, different motivations, different levels of perceived risk and several opportunities for spillover. And you need everything to kind of line up properly for that to happen as well. Um, so it's, it's not just a matter of increasing law enforcement. Um, there's, there's social considerations. There are lots of different ways that um, we need to intervene in order to close commercial trade of wildlife. So it's not so simple. So let's look now a little bit at the land itself. So land use change, uh, ecosystem degradation, these things can um, impact disease risk as well. So land use change uh, that tends to elevate disease risk includes deforestation, expansion of infrastructure uh, like roads and dams, uh, changes in drainage. And this has been fairly well documented. Um, pathogens circulate normally in wildlife inside the forest. It's normal for pathogens to be there. But if we start to destroy the forest uh, for, for logging, um, for development, something is bound to shake out. And even though I'm mostly talking about forests today, similar effects are seen in the degradation of marine systems and savanna grasslands. And one of the most recognized links is change in land use and its influences on contact rates between people and wildlife. And this graphic is from a study um, of forest fragments around Kibale National Park in Africa. And it shows how this process happens. So as degradation is happening and fragmentation starts to happen, you almost get these little forest islands and you get an increased number of forest edges. And that means an increased uh, number of opportunities for humans to come into contact with wildlife, which makes sense. And the impact of degradation is then multiplied by activities that kind of lengthen that edge between intact areas and people. So building roads, um, logging camps, uh, urban expansion, war, things like that. And fragmentation has actually placed over 70% of the world's forests within one kilometer of an edge. So these are some pathogens originating in wildlife that uh, have been associated with ecosystem degradation and human activity. And you probably recognize at least one of these, um, but we have Nipah virus, Hendra virus, and Ebola virus. So to reduce the likelihood of these events, we need to both remove edges and restore intact landscapes and mitigate activity at those edges. And this picture on the right uh, shows one of our colleagues in Africa testing carcass samples as part of a surveillance program that began in the mid 2000s. And the idea is to detect Ebola in wildlife um, where it can cause high mortality, such as in gorillas, for example, before it spills over into people living in remote villages in the Congo. And then from there, you know, it jumps on an airplane for an overnight flight to anywhere in the world. So beyond transmission of pathogens from wildlife to humans uh, directly, we know that intact forests themselves play a role in keeping us healthy. So this study uh, in 35 countries showed that communities living downstream from a damaged forest experience more diarrhea in their kids and have to pay for more medical treatments. 
communities living downstream from a healthy intact forest experience less diarrhea in their kids and they don't pay as much in medical expenses. Um, so researchers found in the study that an increase or 30% increase in upstream tree cover was similar to the effect of improved sanitation on reducing childhood diarrheal risk. Um, so it has about the same effect as introducing sanitation and hygiene. So why is that? Uh, forests provide ecosystem services that help maintain water quality. So um, forests and, and wetlands can filter pollutants and, and pathogens from surface water supplies. Uh, and therefore, when you change forests to agriculture or housing, this can increase those, uh, the levels of pollutants and pathogens in the water, and then ultimately decrease the quality of the water downstream. So I'm gonna talk briefly about uh, how reduction of biodiversity influences disease dynamics. It's not fully understood yet, um, but we're starting to get a clearer picture of what's happening here. So it's true that the more species you have in an ecosystem, the more, more pathogens you will likely find in those hosts in that ecosystem. But it seems that biodiversity acts as almost like a buffer um, in what we call a dilution effect for pathogen spread. And following biodiversity loss, species that are more resilient and adaptable, um, so these kind of generalist species that thrive in, in human dominated landscapes like the little rodent you can see here, these start to increase in numbers. And these are also significant carriers of zoonoses. So there's still many remaining questions surrounding this, but the current evidence indicates that preserving intact ecosystems and their endemic biodiversity should generally reduce the prevalence of infectious diseases. And I'll just touch briefly on agricultural intensification as well. As everyone knows, uh, our population is increasing. So the demand for animal products and food is also going up, which is leading to expansion of agriculture and uh, increase in livestock density. And this is often at the expense of natural ecosystems. So this is one of my favorite photos to use when I talk about interfaces between uh, wildlife and wild places and ourselves. Uh, it was taken by someone at National Geographic named Renan Donovan. Uh, and it was taken in Rwanda. Before I was in Laos, I did some work in Rwanda. And you can see that this is a very hard line here between the farms and the forest. You have farms and, and communities literally butting up right up against the edge of the, the park here. So sometimes you have wildlife like gorillas and, and monkeys and buffalo coming out of the forest and crop raiding or um, getting into villages. And then sometimes you have livestock and people uh, coming out of the communities and, and entering the forest for um, resources. But not all national parks and protected areas have this really defined line. Here in Laos, for example, um, you'll see more of like a mixed use forest around the edge. So you'll have some villages technically inside the park boundary. Uh, you'll have free roaming livestock that go into the forest. So it's a little bit more of a mix. Um, so this really favors the contact between wildlife and humans, either directly or through intermediate animals like livestock. Uh, and this of course also takes a hit to the health of the ecosystem itself. So you start to get soil fertility decreasing, um, water contamination increasing, et cetera. So I'm gonna shift a little bit and just tell you uh, more about what I'm doing specifically here uh, in Laos. So I am, uh, we are connecting a project here called Wild Health Net. Uh, and it's operating not just in Laos, but in Vietnam and Cambodia as well. And the overarching goal of this project uh, is to develop a wildlife health surveillance network uh, at a national scale uh, in each of these countries. And this project is funded by the Department of Defense of the US. So I'll just tell you um, 
a few different components of the project. There are quite a few pieces and a lot of moving parts, but uh, I'll touch on a few of the highlights. So one of the things we're doing here is scaling up um, passive surveillance, which means having people who may come into contact with wildlife or who work with wildlife report events when they occur. When I say events, I mean like wildlife morbidity and mortality events. So for example, coming across 10 dead birds in the forest um, or reporting an outbreak of respiratory signs uh, in a group of monkeys that are being housed in a wildlife sanctuary. And to do this, we often target communities and forest rangers that are patrolling the forests um, to teach them when to report things they detect, how to report, and in some cases, uh, how to sample the wildlife, because these people are really the eyes and ears of the jungle here. So they're almost like an early warning system. They will likely be the first people detecting an unusual mortality event inside these forests. And this helped us uh, a lot in finding for the very first time African swine fever in wild boar here in Southeast Asia. So African swine fever was introduced uh, into Asia in the last couple of years and um, it swept across Asia and uh, caused a lot of damages to the domestic uh, pig populations and people's livelihoods. And we know that it circulates uh, quite a lot in wild boar in Europe, but we hadn't found it yet um, in wild boar here. And it was thanks to reports from communities living at the edges of these forests uh, that we were able to detect the virus for the first time. So communities started to find wild boar carcasses and uh, reported them to us. And we managed to get some samples and confirmed that it is in fact in uh, wild boar here. Oh, sorry. So we're also doing active surveillance for uh, some target pathogens, one of which is avian influenza virus in wild birds. And we recently conducted a study uh, in these wetlands that you'll see here um, where we were uh, sampling wild birds and sampling domestic birds as well. Uh, so what happens in these wetlands is you'll have large uh, groups of migratory birds passing through and hanging out together in this water. And then you'll have domestic ducks and chickens from the neighboring villages coming in and, and intermingling with those wild birds in the same water. So we're sampling wild bird feces, but also water and sediment. Um, and at the same time, the CDC is sampling the domestic uh, poultry side of things in the villages located on the edge of these wetlands. So we're hoping that this data will help uh, increase our knowledge of how spillover happens in these types of contexts and what role the environment might play in that. And we do some slightly less uh, glamorous work as well. So we do a lot of policy development uh, in the country working with our government partners. So right now um, we're doing a lot of work on developing and implementing a standard operating procedure for wildlife health surveillance in Laos. Because uh, before now, um, wildlife health was really nobody's responsibility. There's really no framework that exists here within governments and agencies to do any kind of surveillance in wildlife. So this is one piece of our project that we're currently working on. And I just want to leave you with this graphic. You don't need to read all the details of it. Um, but the reason I'm showing this to you is uh, because the threats to conservation are the same drivers of emergence of zoonotic diseases. So the same things that are threatening the conservation of wildlife and, and wild places are the very same drivers that are leading to things like viral spillover events. So as we've just seen, forest fragmentation, uh, reduction of biodiversity, wildlife trade. And so if we just focus kind of at the end here of um, you know, doing things like uh, creating vaccines and um, scaling up public health systems, those are all very, very important uh, initiatives but it kind of has a narrow impact. And if we're only doing that, it's, it's often too late and the damages are, as we've seen, quite extreme. So 
it makes sense to kind of go back to that source um, and that point of origin and start investing into interventions um, that help prevent these things from getting out of control. So protecting intact landscapes, maintaining ecosystem integrity, stopping wildlife trade, these should all be public health priorities. And with that, I will end our presentation there. Happy to take any questions at this time. I'll turn my camera back on. Awesome, thank you yeah. so much, Dr. Densted. That was incredibly interesting. Okay, so our first question, oh, we don't have one yet. Just Michelle saying, this is the best presentation I've seen in a while. Excellent information. Um, Looks like there's one hand up from see. someone named Carrie. Oh yes, Carrie, yeah. go ahead. Hi, thanks, Emily. That was such an interesting presentation and to hear about your work, I'm just blown away. Um, I'm a huge fan of using crowdsourced surveillance for this type of thing and really involving those stakeholders who are frontline and super affected by these issues. So I'm wondering um, how your buy-in has been from those community members that you're involving. Like, are they really interested in helping you out? Yeah, so um, we actually, we got pretty lucky with, with getting reports of, of wild boar. Um, often what happens is communities can be quite hesitant to report things like dead wildlife uh, because they're worried they're going to be punished or blamed um, for it. Uh, this particular forest where we work is, is heavily patrolled. It, it has the highest level of law enforcement here. Um, so there is sometimes worry and, and hesitancy that does come from communities when we do go in and, and ask them to share information with us. Um, I don't see, people in markets are actually quite willing to um, participate in, in the sampling that we'll, that we'll do. So it may be partially because we have to bring government with us, but typically, you know, we can go into a market, ask to borrow somebody's squirrel or civet, take samples from it, give it back. Um, and, and I think over the years, they've kind of become used to seeing us there in those environments. Um, so it's a mix. Some people are, you know, uh, a bit more hesitant and we have to do a lot of communication with them to reassure them that we are not law enforcement. Um, we're not here to, um, to get them into any kind of trouble. What we're here to do is gather information so that we can better help them and and help their livestock and so forth. Um, so it, sometimes it does take a little bit more communication. Um, we do also recognize that some responses that we'll get to, to interviews and, and things like that will not necessarily be accurate. So sometimes they'll they'll give information, but it's hard to know if they're um, being truthful just because they're they're worried. Uh, to share um, real information. So it's it's a mix for sure. Does that Thank answer you. your question? Yeah, it's all part of the relationship building, right? <laughs> yeah, thanks. We have a couple um, comments coming in through the chat. Um, an amazing presentation. Thank you so much from Kate Dewey. And Chris says, okay. great presentation. This is such an interesting topic, especially in light of the current pandemic. Thank you, Emily. Thanks, everyone. Thank you for joining. Um, and we have another question from Pete. Have you discovered any local Indigenous knowledge that indicates some awareness of best practices to prevent zoonoses? Um, it's a mix. Uh, so we, there have been surveys. I, I wasn't part of them, but my team has done surveys on um, you know, how uh, local communities think they could catch disease from wildlife um, and, and their perceived levels of risk. And so there's quite a range uh, and, and there's quite a, um, yeah, a, a range in, in knowledge uh, of what the local communities know. I would say that since COVID-19 began, their, their knowledge has increased quite a lot. Um, I haven't seen any, I'm not sure 
if there's been much in the reduction in consuming wildlife here, it's, it's hard to know. Um, but I think it's, it's, people have more awareness now than they did before. Um, but when we used to interview them before, um, it, yeah, it was variable of how people thought they would get infected, what types of animals had disease, what types of animals didn't have disease. Um, so quite a mix. Okay. Um, and we've got another comment from Robin, very effective use of graphic simile. They really add to this amazing presentation. Thank you. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Uh, another question from Nora. I may have missed this, but where does your funding come from? Any opportunity for support privately? Yeah, so um, this project, it's a three-year project, and it is funded by uh, the U.S. Department of Defense, uh, specifically their Defense Threat Reduction Agency um, portion um, of the DOD. And the U.S. DOD and USAID um, have been very active over the last decade in funding uh, surveillance of viruses and wildlife. So some of you might be familiar with the PREDICT project, which was a massive global effort, um, which was funded by USAID. And so the US government quite early on started to recognize a need um, of kind of increasing our knowledge and preparedness um, when it comes to diseases that wildlife carry. Uh, so they've, um, they've been funding us um, and they're funding the CDC as well to do avian influenza uh, surveillance here in domestic poultry. So that is our current um, funder. Uh, but we have different teams in our office. So we have a counter wildlife trafficking team. We have an ecotourism team. Um, we have a landscapes level team and they all have different funders. Um, some of them are private, some of them are embassy based. Uh, so it, it varies. Awesome, thank you. Um, I've got a question from the One Health team. I'm curious about the different disciplines involved in this project. Are there social scientists on the team, local knowledge holders, people to help with um, communicating the science to the population? The question is from Anna. Yeah, good question. Uh, so I am the only foreigner on my team. So I have three Lao women um, who work with me and they are, they've been working on this wildlife health team for 11 years, um, some of them. And so they are very well versed in the local knowledge um, here and they're very good at communicating the science um, in a way that the people here will understand even just beyond Lao language, I don't speak Lao language, but um, communicating it in a way that people will understand and um, and you know, be impacted by it. So I rely on them a lot uh, for those types of things. We, on my team, we don't have any social scientists specifically. Um, in our office, we do have people that have done their PhDs on um, indigenous communi communities and, and um, landscape work with communities. Uh, so we do have people in our office that, that have done that work, but not specifically on, on the wildlife health team. Makes sense. Um, Anna also says, yes, I was also wondering about who you work with. How did you get involved with the project? Such an interesting way to apply veterinary medicine. Uh, so I, I had gone back uh, after practicing in, in clinics, I'd gone back to the University of Guelph to do my master's of public health, um, which is what led me to Rwanda. Um, and I was there for about a year and a half on and off. And I was doing One Health work um, in Rwanda. And after that work finished, I just, I started to look for um, similar opportunities. And I literally found this job advertisement on the internet. <laughs> so it, it, yeah, it's um, as simple as that. I, I saw a posting and um, applied for it. Awesome. Um, Kind of going off of Anna's questions there, I'm wondering, do you, does the Wildlife Conservation Society partner with local organizations to, um, I don't know, go into like schools or have like going to community centers or anything like that um, to bring more awareness to the community? Yeah, so 
specifically with us, we do a lot of communication work in villages. So we'll usually um, have the village headman gather the village together and, and we'll do different types of communication activities with them. But um, WCS in Laos does have a, a specific livelihoods um, team that does a lot of educational work. Uh, so they, they spend a lot more time in, in schools um, and environments like that um, doing, doing communication. I haven't spent any time in the schools here, um, but we do have people that are um, going out and, and speaking more publicly in those contexts. I would, first of all, really like to thank you for a fascinating and thought provoking presentation, Emily. Um, I really enjoyed the discussion and I'm sure everybody else did as well. It really sounds like, uh, like people enjoyed, um, enjoyed the presentation. Thanks so much for having me. Really no enjoyed problem. it. No Have a great day, everybody. <laughs>